Well, good evening and welcome to worship this evening at St. Mark's Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Matt Moldstead. I serve just across the river and up the hill. I was told by my niece this evening that we're the church on the mountain. Um, but uh, Peace Lutheran, though, over at North Mankato, glad to be with you here tonight, though, to share God's word with you. Uh, the service is printed for you in the bulletin, also up on the screen. And let us begin then with the opening responses. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To herald your love in the morning. And we'll continue by singing our opening hymn, uh, hymn number 794. Please rise for the confession of sin. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us, that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. 
Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated as we invite the grade school children to come forward.
We continue with our Passion History lesson from the Gospel of St. Matthew this evening. We are continuing that reading in Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 57, a section entitled Jesus Before the Sanhedrin. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Thus far the reading. And we continue with our next hymn, hymn number 407.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our text for our meditation this evening is yet another psalm, a psalm of the Passion, Psalm number 69. And even though this psalm was written by King David, we most definitely know that it is a messianic psalm. We think of just one example in verse number 9, we note what the disciples remembered as Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers, zeal for your house will consume me. We think of especially verse 21 in our lesson for today, as it describes not an event in the life of David, but an event that most certainly took place in the life of Jesus. As he is hanging on the cross and he cries out, I thirst, but he is given only sour wine to drink. So we consider our text for this evening, Psalm 69, verses 1 through 21. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink into the deep mud where there is no place to stand. I have entered deep waters and the rapids rush over me. I am worn out from my crying. My throat is sore. My eyes are blurry as I wait for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs on my head. Those who want to destroy me, my lying enemies, are strong. I must repay things I did not steal. God, you know my folly and my guilt is not hidden from you. May those who place their confidence in you not be put to shame because of me, O Lord, the Lord of armies. May those who seek you not be disgraced because of me, O God of Israel. It is for your sake that I bear scorn. Shame covers my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, a foreigner to my mother's sons. Yes, zeal for your house consumes me. The scorn of those who scorn you falls on me. I wept as I fasted, but this only brought insults to me. When I wore sackcloth as my clothing, I was a joke to them. Those who sit in the gatehouse gossip about me, and the songs of the drunks are about me. But I direct my prayer to you, O Lord, for a time of favor. God, in the greatness of your mercy, answer me with the certainty of salvation from you. Rescue me from the mud so I do not sink. Let me escape from those who hate me and from the deep waters. Do not let the rapids rush over me. Do not let the the deep swallow me up. Do not let the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, Lord, for your mercy is good. According to your great compassion, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant, because I am in distress. Hurry, answer me. Come near, redeem my soul. Ransom me because of my enemies. You know my disgrace, my shame, and my confusion. All my foes are in front of you. Disgrace has broken my heart, and I am helpless. I waited for sympathy, but there was none. I waited for comforters, but I did not find any. Instead, they put bitter poison in my food. For my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Lord, these are your words, and therefore they are your truth. We ask that you'd increase our faith through them. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, what comes to mind when you think of a broken heart I think for many of us, we probably think of uh, maybe a young couple in a romantic relationship. Maybe there's a certain young man who has fallen head over heels for a certain young woman. He thinks she's the one. He thinks they're going to get married and they're going to spend the rest of their life together. And then she breaks his heart, right? She tells him, we're through, we're finished. You know, another place where we maybe use that phrase, broken heart, is when we're describing how we feel uh, concerning someone else. As we uh, express our empathy for someone, that our heart breaks for them because they've experienced such a tremendous loss or they're, they're going through something so difficult or so troubling. Well, in verse 20 in our text for this evening, we hear this from the Messiah, disgrace, has broken my heart, and I am helpless. His affliction, especially the mistreatment that he is experiencing by sinful men, has broken his heart, and he expresses it to God as he offers God really a prayer in our text for today. So we consider that as our theme, the prayer of the brokenhearted, and we'll see that that prayer shares its affliction with God, but also we'll see that that prayer also trusts in God for deliverance. In verse 2, the Messiah cries out to God, I sink into the deep mud where there is no place to stand. I have entered deep waters and the rapids rush over me. 
A number of years ago when I was living down in Florida, I did one of those mud runs. I don't know if any of you are into running or have ever done a mud run before. It's a 5K race, so about three miles or so with about 20-some obstacles in it. And I thought I was doing pretty well in the race, was probably about two-thirds of the way through until I hit the mud. And I'm not talking about a little puddle that maybe would have stained my clothing. I'm talking about sticky, deep, thick mud. And that obstacle was probably like a football field long. And I couldn't believe it when I hit the mud, my, my foot went in first, then my ankle, then all the way soon I was up to my knees in mud. And, and I could hardly move. And I'm looking down beside me and there's shoes stuck in the holes next to me there too. And, and I think of that experience as we think about what the Messiah says here with this reference to the deep mud as well. Uh, that it's something that's not allowing him to move forward as he's just sinking down further, as he's expressing to God really the hopelessness of his situation, how he is overwhelmed with his affliction. We think about that as some of his prayer, but then he he goes on to say this, I'm worn out from my crying, my throat is sore, my eyes are blurry as I wait for my God. It's interesting, he not only expresses the affliction and his feeling of being overwhelmed that he's experiencing, but he also seems to be telling God, God, you're not helping quick enough, right? Where are you, God? And my eyes are, are, my throat is sore, my eyes are, are blurry, I'm worn out from my crying as I wait for my God. And we think of those emotions as, as real and raw emotions. We definitely can see a parallel to Jesus on the cross as he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he goes on in verse five, he says this, God, you know my folly and my guilt is not hidden from you. You know, when we look, look at that verse, we might wonder to ourselves, well, wait a minute, pastor, are these really the words of the Messiah? How could they be? The Messiah is perfect and holy in every way. He's sinless. He has no guilt. How can he say that God knows his folly and his guilt isn't hidden from him? Well, that difficulty is easily removed when we remember what it says in Isaiah chapter 53. The Lord has charged all our guilt to him. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where it says this, God made him who did not know sin to become sin for us. Yes, the Messiah is expressing the anguish and punishment that he is enduring for crimes he did not commit. Though he knows that that punishment needs to be carried out and he expresses to God even the guilt that he bears. He goes on to lament the cruel actions of others. He says this, I wept as I fasted, but this only brought insults to me. When I wore sackcloth as my clothing, I was a joke to them. I waited for sympathy, but there was none. I waited for comforters, but I did not find any. Instead, they put bitter poison in my food. For my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. In all he's experiencing, mankind has also turned against him. As he seeks for comforters, as he seeks for sympathy, he's only a laughingstock and a joke as they hurl their insults at him. And even as he asks for something to drink, as he cries out, I thirst, he's only given sour wine. You know, we think about these as the words of the Messiah, but I think we also can relate to some of them too, can't we? As we think about what he speaks here as really words and as he expresses emotions that, that are raw and real, as it is a reminder to us that Christianity isn't just sunshine and roses all the time. There is trial, trouble, difficulty, affliction, loss. God wants us to express those things to him as we cry out to him in prayer. But why? Now, it's been said in our modern era that there is something therapeutic about simply getting your emotions and your feelings off your chest. Well, that's really not God's purpose. God wants us to share what we are going through with him in prayer because he cares for us. You know, we think of a a mother who wants to always hear whatever her child is going through, no matter how much trouble 
or, or how much hardship they're enduring, even if it's all their own fault, she wants to hear and she wants to help because she's the child's mother. So also we think of our God. He always wants to hear. He always wants to know what we are going through because he cares and because he also wants to help. In Psalm 50, verse 15, it says this, Call on me in the day of distress. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. God invites us, call on me, pray to me when you're in trouble and in distress. And what does he promise to do? He promises to deliver us, to rescue us. You know, it's quite amazing as we go through the words of Psalm 69, as we think about everything the Messiah was enduring and everything that's expressed here in this psalm, Yet, despite all of his suffering, despite even crying out to God as he's waiting on the Lord to answer, yet he still has this tremendous amount of trust, doesn't he? He has this trust that God is going to rescue him. God is going to deliver him. And he goes on. I direct my prayer to you, O Lord, for a time of favor. God, in the greatness of your mercy, answer me with the certainty of salvation from you. Rescue me, turn to me, do not hide your face from your servant. Come near, redeem my soul, ransom me. You think of the Messiah even in the midst of his distress, still calling out to God with great confidence as he trusts in him to help and to save. But what about Jesus? What about Jesus, especially as we think of him crying out to his heavenly father in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? As we hear in Holy Scripture that prayer from his own lips, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And we hear then that, that Scripture that he was in anguish, and we hear that his sweat was like drops of blood as he's praying to the Heavenly Father to take this cup of suffering away from him. Where was God to help? Why wasn't God rescuing him? Why wasn't he saving him. You know, we can think about God's response to that prayer even in the garden. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Even as Jesus expresses that to the Heavenly Father, the Heavenly Father does not take away the cup of suffering from him, but he does do this. He sends an angel, an angel to strengthen him for what lies ahead, for the suffering he's going to endure at the cross. But again, why doesn't God take away that suffering? Why does he allow his son to be arrested in the garden? Why does he allow him to be wrongfully accused, to be mocked and ridiculed, to be struck in the face and to have that crown of thorns pounded into his head? Why does he allow him to be put up on the cross and have the nails driven through his hands and feet to endure agony, not just the cross, but even hell itself? Why does he allow that to happen to his son? Doesn't he love his son? You know, we hear in Isaiah chapter 53 these words, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to allow him to suffer. We hear those words, we can say, that sounds so cruel. What parent would ever do that? What parent would ever say that it is my will to crush my son, to crush my child? We think about the response of a parent is so often to protect their child, especially if their child is facing something so terrible, let alone death, that what parent wouldn't be willing to die for their own child if their life is at risk? Didn't God love his son? Well, of course he did. Many times throughout Jesus' ministry, we, we hear God the Father even speaking from heaven, this is my son whom I love and in whom I am well pleased he certainly loved his son. So why did he allow him to suffer? Why did he allow him to drink that cup of suffering to its dregs? It was not simply because he loved his son, but because he also loves you. He knew that the only way that your sin could be covered, the only way that you could be rescued from a terrible fate worse than crucifixion, hell itself, the only way that you who have separated yourself from God by your sins, the only way you could be brought into a good relationship with him would be through the death of the perfect holy son of God. He knew that alone 
could redeem you. And so it was because of his love for you that he willed that his son be crushed, that he suffer and die on a cross. The amazing thing, though, is that God does not disappoint his son. That son asks for God's deliverance, for his salvation, and maybe we say, well, where was God when he was at the cross as he allows all of that, as he allows his son even to die too? But we note the words of the Messiah in another psalm, Psalm 16, where it says this, you will not abandon my life to the grave, you will not let your favored one see decay. And I I think that's incredibly interesting to consider. You know, we think about our, our own suffering and our own loss and our own difficulties and trials and troubles that we go through in our own life. And as we cry out to God, God, help me in time of trouble. God, relieve my pain. And maybe we wonder, where is God? God, why aren't you taking this away from me, right? And we don't always know why God allows us to suffer. We see it so clearly with Jesus. We think about the Apostle Paul, too, when he cries out to God to take away the thorn in his flesh as he prays three times, but God responds, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. As we do know, God allows us to endure suffering and hardship and trouble and loss at times, and we don't always know the reason why and and what God is doing But we do know this, God's will for us is good. And we do know this as well, God is always going to deliver you from your affliction, no matter what. We think about the words from Psalm 50 again, call upon me in the day of distress, I will deliver you and you will honor me. Now go back to Jesus. God allowed him to suffer. God allowed him to die but God did not abandon him to the grave, did he? He did not allow his Holy One to see decay. He did deliver him in the end, didn't he? What comfort that can provide for us as well as we think about our own hardship and affliction, that even as we cry out to God, as we wonder, why aren't you relieving my sorrow and suffering and pain right now? He promises to deliver us. Even if he allows us to die, he still promises to deliver us. And he's gonna rescue us from the grave just as he had promised And we can be certain of that because of his son who lived and died for you because of what he did and because he wasn't abandoned to the grave. We can be confident that his promises for us are true as well and that even though we endure suffering now, glory awaits us forever in heaven and he's going to bring us to glory one day and we are going to honor him on that day. You know, Psalm 69 is a psalm that we clearly see are words of the Messiah as he's crying out to the Father as he's experiencing so much suffering, especially in connection to his passion. We consider his prayer this evening, and we want to make it our own as well, as we too at times are brokenhearted. God wants us also to pray to him, to share with him what we are going through, our affliction, our distress, our trouble, but also to continue to pray to him, confident that he will deliver, that he will rescue. And our confidence is found in Christ, who was turned over to death in the cross for you. But God did not abandon him to the grave, but he also raised him to life again. That is our same confidence. Amen. I invite the congregation to please rise for the blessing. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the offering. During the offering, we also encourage you to please fill out the friendship registries in your pews.
Please arise for prayer. <coughs> Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. In righteousness I shall see you. When I awake, your presence will give me joy. Be, merciful, be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the silent hours of this night so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins, and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, and that the wicked fall may have no power over me. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. And you may be seated for our closing hymn. <laughs> Good evening to all once again. Um, once again, my name is Pastor Matt Molstead. Uh, I always enjoy being a part of this. I know uh, uh, since we have four churches in town, two in the Wisconsin Synod and two in the ELS, uh, especially us guys in the ELS don't often uh, rub shoulders enough to, with our churches in the Wisconsin Synod. Uh, so great to uh, celebrate our fellowship even as we continue our Lenten rotation this year. Uh, just uh, 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 one thing I wanted to mention about our congregation. Uh, so over this last year, so it was just over a year ago, Pastor uh, Tim Hartwig, so a longtime pastor at Peace, he's one of our Australians at Peace, uh, he actually was on the rotation last year, would have been here at St. Mark's last year. He took a call to uh, Bethany uh, Theological Seminary, and so now he's serving as the president over at Bethany Seminary. And so we were without a second pastor for a while, but uh, this summer uh, we uh, rejoiced that the Lord provided us with a second pastor uh, by the name of Ben Weekman, and so he'll be with you next year uh, as part of this rotation. And we also rejoice with you, of course, as you have received a pastor this past year in Pastor Borman. Uh, so such a wonderful blessing that, that God has bestowed as he has given you a wonderful gift in him. I don't have any other special announcements to give to you this evening. The Lord's richest blessings to each and every one of you. <laughs> 